Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, 100 years on from his death, the British celebrate the life of John Ruskin. The injection of lottery funds puts new life into museums and galleries. A special exhibition shows a sentimental and human side to the royal family. Some 500 pieces of Spanish artist Dali's work are now on permanent display at Dali's Universe. And finally, a Suffolk farmer's model of the Second Temple of Jerusalem is visited by people from all over the world. First up, John Ruskin, artist and critic, teacher and social commentator. This year marks 100 years since the death of this famous and influential 19th century Englishman. A number of exhibitions, like this one at the Tate Gallery, are being staged to celebrate the multifaceted career of this extraordinary man. Most are focusing on his contribution to art. Joseph Turner's reputation as a painter is secure today, but his huge, dramatically coloured canvases like this one, it depicts slave traders throwing overboard sick and dying slaves, might still be dismissed as soap suds and jam, as contemporary critics did were it not for Ruskin and his father taking an interest in Turner. Ruskin also championed the cause of an emerging school of English painters in the mid-19th century, known as the Pre-Raphaelites. This painting by his friend John Millais contains two elements that appealed to Ruskin, the Gothic style of architecture and a close observation of nature. For Ruskin, looking forward meant in some senses looking back. In architecture, he was drawn to the medieval Gothic style, like that used in the Natural History Museum in Oxford. England in Ruskin's day was becoming the industrial powerhouse of the world, but he saw factories and machines as diminishing people's understanding and appreciation of nature. The plants that spring from these pillars and capitals, like those in pre-Raphaelite paintings, embody Ruskin's deep attachment to nature, the late motive as his whole life and thinking. While a student at nearby Christchurch College, Ruskin made a close study of these Italian Gothic paintings. They now form part of a special Ruskin centenary exhibition at the college. This early drawing shows the view from Ruskin's own room at Christchurch. It's a view that has changed little. From his youth, he travelled widely. Venice held a special fascination for Ruskin. Among his many writings was a study of Venetian architecture. His sketches of the city's buildings and canals hold more than merely aesthetic value. They're an accurate historical record of what the buildings actually look like. From a young age, he travelled, wrote and sketched. He saw nature as a revelation of the divine and art as man's medium of perceiving nature and therefore God. Looking at his subjects in a microscopic analytical sense, his was a scientific as well as an artistic approach. For most of his life, Ruskin lived in London, but it was this painting of the view looking across the lake of Coniston Water that persuaded Ruskin to move to the Lake District in 1871. His house and the extensive gardens became a sort of laboratory of his ideas on landscaping and horticulture. He transformed the open moor and ancient woodland into a mixture of natural and cultivated land. After a century of neglect, experts are now reconstructing the gardens and discovering long hidden paths, reservoirs and terracing. But this was no ivory tower for Ruskin the intellectual. His eight years of active work made it a working garden. When he first came to Brantwood in 1871, he was also setting up an organisation called the Guild of St George. One of the prime aims of this organisation was to encourage people to donate a percentage of their wealth towards the purchase and reclamation of neglected or barren land. The newest attraction for visitors to the house and gardens at Brantwood is a medieval herb garden.
Among the visitors are Ruskin scholars from nearby Lancaster University. Students here can take a one-year course in Ruskin studies, immersing themselves in his writings on art, nature and society. It's a rare example of a university course being devoted to one man's vision and work. Writers like Tolstoy and Proust held Ruskin in high regard as a thinker on social reform. He was at the core of the political alternatives that were generated in the 20th century. Mahatma Gandhi, the diminutive yet towering figure of India's struggle for independence, acknowledged a debt to Ruskin. In Oxford, his ideas on education and social reform live on in the college that bears his name. Ruskin College was set up to give those who had missed out on formal education, mainly working class students, the chance of a university education. It still fulfills this role. Bob Purdy, a former student who now teaches here in politics, says Ruskin College today is providing such second chances to students outside Britain too. His interests and influences are many and varied, but it was John Ruskin's deep attachment to nature that lies at the heart of all his achievements. Today, with the environmental impact of industrialisation much clearer than in Ruskin's day, this may ultimately prove his most crucial legacy. The Lowry Museum at Salford Quays near Manchester. The new Walsall Gallery. Birmingham's Museum and Art Gallery. From the National Portrait Gallery in central London to the Dulwich Picture Gallery in the suburbs. Britain's museums and galleries are flourishing as never before. Fueled by lottery money, it's a golden age for museum funding and building, with more than $640 million US being spent on new cultural venues. The elegant home of Resource, the Council for Museums, Archives and Libraries. Director of Communications Julie Taylor welcomed the injection of lottery money and the expansion, explaining that it has raised the profile of the arts within the UK and globally through Europe and beyond. Like the activity at Birmingham City Art Gallery in the West Midlands of England. England's second city was host to an event in the first ever Museums and Galleries Month, a celebration of Britain's cultural heritage. Some 1,500 venues are taking part. Art galleries have become more than just visitor attractions. They now play a major role in the learning society. For these children from a local school, it's a very special occasion. They're trying on traditional Indian dress and learning about Indian culture before helping to launch an exciting and dynamic program of events in the whole of the area as part of the Museums and Galleries Month. The new Millennium Bridge under construction across the Thames. It leads to perhaps the most exciting of the new galleries, Tate Modern. Costing some 134.5 million pounds, or over 201 million US dollars, it's set to become a symbol of London in the 21st century. It's housed in a former power station, and the massive hall makes a grand spectacular entrance to one of the world's great art galleries. Traditional Monets mix with the moderns. There's space for the earlier treasures of the collection, like this beautiful Matisse. The brick installation which caused a furor when it was first exhibited. And the icons of modern art like Andy Warhol. Video art is represented alongside one of the great founders of modern art. American Jackson Pollock previously hanging at Tate Millbank. Tate Modern is set to regenerate the whole area and is one of the great and largest galleries of the world. By contrast, the National Portrait Gallery across the river near Trafalgar Square doesn't seem to have changed from the outside, 
but inside there's a vast difference. This small but popular gallery attracts a million visitors a year. Its main collection chronicles those who made Britain's history, from Shakespeare to the Rolling Stones. The Tudor Gallery in all its glory. The new wing, named after Canadian financer Christopher Ondaatje, and the culmination of six years' work, cost almost $26 million US. It's enabled the public to see the collection as it should be seen. And a new restaurant on the roof is the only public space with views across Trafalgar Square and Whitehall to the Houses of Parliament. It's nearly always fully booked. The leafy suburb of Dulwich in south-east London is home to England's oldest public art gallery, opened in 1811. Work is frantically going ahead to meet the deadline for the Queen to open a new building and a refurbished gallery. The project costs some 13.5 million US dollars and will make this venue even more popular. It's a race against time to get the paintings ready. Dulwich has an outstanding collection. There's this magnificent Hogarth, portrait of an unknown man. A famous Gainsborough. And work attributed to Rembrandt. The new gallery will be full of space and light, with a garden and a restaurant. From the traditional to the modern, the Lowry at Salford Quays near Manchester. It's seen as more than just a museum, but as a catalyst for urban regeneration. It's a stunning architectural flagship costing some 158.85 million US dollars and will create thousands of jobs. There's bars, cafes and restaurants and two theatres. There's 730 seat building and a small 466 seat adaptable space. A conventional self-portrait painted in 1925, L.S. Lowry is probably Britain's most popular artist, but he was a complex and secretive character. His industrial landscapes and pictures of northern mills have a humanity and directness which make them accessible to all. The Lowry is just one of the many hundreds of Britain's museums and galleries which have been revitalised by lottery funding and are said to improve the cultural life of the nation into the new millennium. Prince Charles was aged four at his mother's coronation in 1953, one of the most auspicious events of the century. As with many who treasure a wedding dress or an outfit to remind them of an occasion, the British royal family kept the suit worn by the young Prince of Wales that day. His silk shirt with jabot and cuffs of silk lace and trousers of fine wool worn on that June day 47 years ago now form part of a special display at London's Kensington Palace. The clothes worn by six generations of British royal children date back to 1810, when the 14-year-old Princess Charlotte wore this muslin dress. She was the daughter of the then Prince Regent, later King George IV, and Princess Caroline. The royal family, like many other families, tucked away a beautiful collection of baby shoes, tiny little dresses worn by both boys and girls, shawls, fans and so on, for their own pleasure, to remind them of the happy days when their children were little. 
These little matching purple suits were worn by the two oldest children of Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. Aged four, Prince Albert Victor and his brother, three-year-old Prince George, wore these outfits of ermine-trimmed silk velvet when they were being shown off to their grandparents in Denmark in 1868. <laughs> this silk velvet skirt and bodice was worn by Princess Victoria when she was about 14. She later became queen and married Albert. The pair spent a lot of time in their beloved Scotland and Victoria adapted the tartan for her eldest children. Prince Albert even designed a tartan for the children to wear and we see Princess Vicky wearing a pink tartan and wearing a blue tartan is her younger brother Albert Edward who becomes Edward VII but who is then known as Bertie. Baby boys wore dresses before they were deemed old enough for trousers. When he was one, Prince Henry, the third son of King George V and Queen Mary, wore this cotton organdy dress. Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret wore these robes to the coronation of their father, King George V, in 1937. As well as historically commemorating important royal events, the royal ceremonial dress collection shows a sentimental and human side to the royal family. If you set a crane winching a pair of eight metre tall elephant legs into a place on the banks of the Thames was a slightly surreal sight, you'd be spot on. In fact, surrealism is the whole idea behind this operation on London's Queen's Walk. The pieces being fitted together are sculptural representations of some of the most enduring images of the two-dimensional work of surrealist painter Salvador Dali. The appearance of unrelated items like the melted clock faces in Dali's profile of time and space elephants would upset contemporary audiences. Dali's aim was to shock, intrigue and provoke thought. Yet today these same images have become well-loved quirky motives, almost icons of Dali and modern art. Here they herald the Dali universe, the permanent gallery at County Hall dedicated to the Spanish artist. The exhibition has been created by Benjamin Levy, a close personal friend of Dali's. It includes a large number of works never seen in Britain before. It will have the world's largest collection of his sculptures and examples of his work in glass, gold, furniture, fashion and of course in watercolours and etchings. Nestling between the Millennium Eye and the Aquarium, the sculptures and gallery will be another eye-catching addition to the city's cultural landscape. The airliner of the future. The double-decker A3XX will be the world's largest jumbo jet. With bedrooms, a gymnasium and even shops planned, it's already being dubbed the Flying Hotel, and some even say a work of art. The British government has announced a £530 million, or dollars million US investment in the project. Three other European countries are involved in the $16 billion Airbus project to rival America's mighty Boeing 747. The plane's wings were built by BAE Systems in the UK. A research team has been working for over three years on the project, which is expected to create 22,000 jobs in Britain alone. Thousands more aviation industry jobs will be safeguarded as a result of the project. Each plane will be built to the individual specification of the purchasing airline. Without frills, each plane could carry up to 900 people, but already airlines are planning extra incentives to attract passengers on board. The Superjet is expected to begin rolling off the production line in the second half of the decade, and by 2010, thousands of people should be experiencing a whole new generation of flying luxury. Also supersized, the largest racing yacht in the world makes its way slowly up the Thames towards London. But this sleek catamaran with its long twin hulls and tall masts has a real taste for speed. 
In trials, the six-man crew have been able to sense the power concealed in the deceptively anorexic body of this carbon fibre greyhound. Skipper and ex-marine Pete Goss managed to get not only this military band, but the Queen herself to give the vessel its official naming at a ceremony by London's Tower Bridge. What I'd like to do now... The boat's six-man crew are preparing for an attempt on the record for sailing non-stop around the world, the so-called Jules Verne Trophy. They have no preconceptions about the severe challenges the rays will pose. There'll be little rest for any of them as they tackle wind, waves and unpredictable weather. The round-the-world record that Team Phillips is trying to break stands now at a little over 71 and a half days. Everything on the boat is designed to go faster, but also on board is state-of-the-art communications that will enable those interested to follow the boat's progress via a dedicated website, a truly modern sea racer. Finally, it's an unlikely place of pilgrimage. This farm in deepest Suffolk has attracted religious groups and archaeologists from all over the world, thanks to the dedication of farmer Alec Garrard. For the last 20 years, he's devoted himself to building a model of the Second Temple of Jerusalem, begun in 19 BC by King Herod the Great and flattened 150 years later by the Romans. His model, which covers 10 square yards, is regarded as a masterpiece perhaps the most plausible depiction yet of what the temple looked like. 20 years ago, Alec Gerard realised the experts had got it wrong. His investigation, carried out from the point of view of a builder, demonstrated that previously accepted renditions of the temple were mistaken. Now he's become an internationally acknowledged expert on construction techniques of the Herodian period. In between interruptions by visitors from all over the world, Alec continues to work on his model. It's a lifelong project, and with fresh information regularly becoming available from Jerusalem, it's one he doesn't think he'll ever finish. He makes everything himself, from sculpting the 3,600 characters to cutting the plywood frames and hand-baking and painting the temple's clay tiles. Slowly but surely, this model of one of the greatest buildings in the ancient world is becoming an object of pilgrimage in its own right. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places, the arts and curiosities.